So basically, Bitcoin is like a guillotine. So you mention it, and it goes down on your head, and it cuts it off. It's uh, what? It's like a guillotine. Every time you mention yes. Bitcoin, basically the other party you're trying to sell the technology to shuts off. Yes. We, we experience that when we deliver blockchain technology with the Red Cross together to Lebanon. When we mentioned the word Bitcoin, the counterparties we dealt with usually had a big issue of listening to the advantages of the technology. Right. And so how do, we, how do we go around that? What's your take on that? Well, I mean, the reason is because there has been a very strong campaign to ensure that Bitcoin is associated with negative things. And this is not a coincidence. This is exactly the response you see to any disruptive technology. So you have two things. First of all, you have a technology that is different enough, that is difficult to understand. And then you have that technology offending some of the well-entrenched issues. Um, I can guarantee you that the Stable and Horse Carriage Association of Switzerland was none too happy about this new automobile idea. And I'm sure they talked to a lot of journalists about how these devices would kill people on the street. Um, and made too much noise and broke down and were unreliable. Now, if you think that's a joke, you should go look out the um, Red Flag Act that was passed in the United Kingdom in 1896 that required every uh, automobile greater than a certain length to have an operator, an engineer, and a conductor. And they had to have a flag person running ahead of the automobile, waving a red flag to warn all of the innocent, terrified pedestrians that an infernal death machine was barreling down the road, trying to kill them. This law passed in England, and it slowed down the development of automobiles fatally for England. These things happen again and again and again and again. The initial response you get is part fear of change, part engineered fear um, because of interests. And, and Bitcoin, just like the internet, look at all of the articles that were written in 1992, 93, 94 about the internet. The internet is a den of thieves and pedophiles and criminals and terrorists. And if you let your children get onto the internet, they will surely be destroyed. And no one uses it except for criminals and weird scientists. But we already knew they were weird anyway. Um, and it has no practical use, because we have fax machines and post offices that work perfectly fine. Thank you very much. And in any case, the phone companies are building a much better version, which is the internet, only without any of the open, borderless, content-creating innovation and freedom that the internet is. Just closed, curated, editorially controlled, safe, PG-13, appropriate for all audiences, and boring. And in the end, those things failed. And they failed because what was exciting about the internet was that it was open and decentralized and borderless. And in the end, yes, criminals used the internet. Of course they did, just like they used automobiles and electricity and phones and shoes to run away from robberies. And the bottom line is, you don't make transportation policy, or shoe policy, or telephone policy, or internet policy, or financial policy, based on the narrow use a criminal will apply to a technology. You look at the bigger picture, as to what happens if you give the tools of financial freedom to 7.5 billion people. Now, that's terrifying to some. I don't care. I'm not going to try to sell this. Because this Bitcoin is useful, because it solves real problems for real people. So if you want to just wrap it up in a nice little blockchain shell and put a bow around it and say, "Don't worry, this is just like Bitcoin, only safer, and you know, not going to be used by criminals." Of course, it's going to be used by criminals. You know why? Because criminals run the banks. <laughs> Because criminals run governments. They are some of the biggest criminals out there, and eventually they're going to be using Bitcoin technology too. So I'm not worried about trying to market this. What I'm worried about is how do we make it useful to as many people as possible. And the rest is it will simply be washed away in history. And one day our children will hear this completely fabricated story. And the fabricated story will be, and Satoshi Nakamoto invented blockchain, and the world rejoiced. 
and was never the same again. Just like we do the story, if you go into an American school and you ask them, how was the automobile invented, or who invented electricity? Edison came with the idea, tried it once, everybody hailed him as a hero, it was a stunning success, and the world moved on. Ford created automobiles for everyone, everyone was happy. Of course, neither of those people actually created the thing, and they were ridiculed for decades. <laughs> Some of the inventors of these technologies died poor and ridiculed <laughs> and destroyed. We rewrite the history later. So I'm not worried about perception. That's a very long answer to your question, but there you go. Thank you. By the way, right. great book, great lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello. Who's I'm got here. It? Oh, over the, oh, we have two microphones. <laughs> awesome. Yes. Thanks for all these analogies. That was very interesting. Thank you. I just didn't get one point. Is what is um, the infrastructure which will be needed for Bitcoin to become mainstream? Right. Well, you know, part of the infrastructure. The good news is we don't have to do all of the heavy lifting of building new roads and building new internet because we already have the internet. So that's one big difference in this infrastructure inversion. The infrastructure we're building or need to build within Bitcoin is access to financial capabilities and the liquidity to make those viable. That means having enough people who have access to wallets, and wallets uh, that are decentralized and easy to use, and easy to secure, and easy to understand. And education for developers who are writing these applications, and education for users. And, um, all of the things that need to smooth adoption. Now, right now, Bitcoin is difficult to use, it's difficult to secure, it's still the very early stages, and that's fine. Um, as we educate more developers in more languages across the world, and they build better applications suited to the local languages, and more people get involved and start using Bitcoin as a means of exchange, you build liquidity. Liquidity allows more applications. Density of adoption allows more applications. Um, the network effect kicks in, and uh, as each new person is added to a network, the usefulness of the network increases exponentially, because for the new person, connecting to everybody else is useful. But for everybody else, the fact that they now can connect to a new person is also useful. And that's the exponential effect of Metcalfe's laws, it's called the network effect. That's what's required here. We're not going to need to build physical infrastructure. We're going to need to build better and easier ways of getting on, so that more people get on, so that we have social infrastructure, economic infrastructure. This is an economic tool, and therefore having a robust econ economy with economic activity is the infrastructure for Bitcoin. You will know when we have it. It's a very simple, very simple test. The day when you ask someone, how much is one Bitcoin? And they say, oh, it's... it's I don't, it's, what do you mean? It's one Bitcoin. One Bitcoin is a thousand millibits, uh, 100 million Satoshis, or one Bitcoin. No, no, but how much is it in dollars? Oh, well, well I mean, a dollar is zero point something Bitcoin, but who cares? <laughs> That's when you know we've made the economic inversion, the infrastructure inversion. Yes, um, do we have a microphone? Okay, and if the next person wants to raise their hand so we can get a microphone for you in advance, very good. Go ahead. Uh, so, the key fulcrum to blockchain technology is decentralized uh, ledger and decentralized consensus. And you talk about a future where this could be the economic standard, so to say, across the world. And you mentioned seven and a half billion people. My question really is, those people are not evenly distributed, right? So, no, hypothetically, there could be a... a, a country which could dominate in terms of mining power, and then um, it's not so neutral anymore as a platform, right? So is there any way, you have any thoughts around that, how we can overcome it? Because this would be one of the questions that governments across the world would ask when yes. trying to adopt this. Well, well d domination by a single country um, is extremely unlikely because the, the bottom line is, I mean, you will see in the early stages, especially because of certain convergence of characteristics, like for example, the availab availability of cheap and uh, immediate geographic access to silicon fabrication is an advantage today. And it's an advantage because we're moving 
from generation to generation of ASIC every three months. That era is over. We hit 16 nanometers. We're not changing ASIC generations now for two years. That's going to change the environment of mining dramatically. I'm not that worried about centralization in any single country. Um, you know, countries would be worried about that. Well, you know, if you think about it, uh, today our currencies are run by a proof of oil consensus algorithm, right? And there is a certain amount of concentration of the underlying proof of oil resource in some countries, which some, admittedly may have said leads to war. Um, so th that doesn't change. Digital cryptocurrencies, decentralized currencies, they still have people in them, and these people still will engage in geopolitical games. That doesn't change, but the, how decentralized things are changes the equation. It makes it less likely that you're going to have such um, specific concentrations that are based on a resource that really can't move, because it's been there for millions of years. Um, so I think we're going to see a very different environment evolve. I don't know what that environment will be yet. So th this is part of being part of history. You get to see it as it unfolds. Who's got the next question? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I just, if I may, would like to go back to the um, to the original question. You talked about the status quo, fighting the new um, technology, and this whole idea of co-opting and the banks being against Bitcoin. If you look back over, the, I don't know, let's say the last six to nine months, it seems like banks are going bananas for the blockchain. Yes. Um, there's, oh, they're opening up laboratories, they're coming with this, and Blythe Masses is running around, and all of this other stuff. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about if you're, not, if you're really sure that the banks won't succeed in co-opting this technology, bolting the old system on top, and then we all keep going like we are, or is it really going to open up hmm. to everyone? That's a really good question. And if they could co-opt this technology, they certainly would. Um, but that, the problem is understanding exactly what's at stake here and what the differentiation is. The, the thing that makes Bitcoin interesting is not the fact that you can use it to record transactions in a chain of blocks. That is not interesting. That is, in fact, stunningly boring from a database science perspective. Um, what is interesting is being able to remove central uh, control of third parties by decentralizing the security mechanism through a proof-of-work consensus algorithm. What that gives you is a set of capabilities. Immutability, unforgeability, open access, permissionless innovation, borderless systems, and censorship resistance. And none of these are in any way remotely interesting to banks, and they don't want any of them. So what they're trying to do is say, we see what you have there. We would like the same, only without the open, borderless, permissionless innovation, decentralized control, open access, and censorship resistance. Could we have one of those? And that's exactly like saying, I like this internet thing you have there. I think the underlying technology is packet switching. And packet switching is fantastic. Forget the net neutrality, open borderless publishing, and freedom of expression. Blah blah blah. <laughs> you know that's irrelevant. What we really want to do is use packet switching to transmit corporate-produced content directly into the TVs of every household in a centralized, top-down, hierarchical way, where we control the content and don't worry, it will all be suitable for your children. Produced by. Disney and controlled forever by us. They failed to do that, because that's not what people wanted. Because What they saw in the internet was the possibility of taking control of the means of producing content, and becoming consumers and producers of content, of equalizing things. And the ability to directly connect with people around the world was exciting. That's what blockchain doesn't have the way they call it. Right? So the thing you have to ask yourself is, what are the seven and a half billion people on this planet looking for in terms of economic inclusion? Are they looking for something that has identity and KYC and controls on the borders and regulations about the amounts and totalitarian surveillance and a very cozy relationship between regulators and state and money? Or are they looking for a new way? And the answer is simple. Most of them are not part of that system, because they haven't been invited. And they'll never be invited, because right now what we're doing is restricting 
the number of people who could actually access that system. Economic inclusion is backtracking. So what Bitcoin offers is not what the banks are co-opting. What they're co-opting is a system that has nothing to do with what we're building. This is a comparison between centralization and decentralization, and they can't co-opt decentralization. Because by co-opting decentralization, they lose all the power. So some banks will. Some banks will adopt decentralization as their go-forward mantra. And big chunks of the industry will be replaced by companies you've never heard of before. Which is why the top companies on the internet are not the phone companies. For the same exact reason. I'm not worried about banks co-opting blockchains. They have bigger problems. They've got to figure out what the hell to do with interest rates. <laughs> Oops. <laughs>